She knows it. A couple announcements to go over this morning. Maybe uh, first and foremost, Vicki Raley sends you her love. She has been away for a, a little while. She's been having some difficulties physically, and she had to go stay with a sister, and now she has just been able to be uh, introduced to uh, Julia Manor, which is only a couple blocks away. She's going to be there for maybe 60 to 90 days, so she has asked that we would please keep her in her prayers, and she wants her church family to know where she is and why she's not here with us, but just please, uh, she, I got some room information. She just got uh, admitted yesterday, so uh, we can actually send her, you know, some, maybe some cards and some love letters right now. She has to be in quarantine for the next 14 days because of an outsider coming into the, the home, and so I think it's going to be a little bit difficult for her to be alone for 14 days, so if we could just maybe send up some prayers uh, to her just to let her know that she is not forgotten, and she's temporarily displaced, but she is still a part of our family here together. Amen? So uh, next week, we're going to be having communion. We're going to participate here uh, in church. If you are uh, with us online only, please go ahead and just grab some crackers and some juice so you can partake in communion, Holy Communion with us next Sunday at home or in the building here. It's going to be great. And uh, we are trying out something new. Before, we had a uh, sort of an email system that went around to sign up for meals. We have Meal Train. If you are interested in providing meals for anybody ever, please check out our website. And anytime we have a Meal Train uh, sign-up opportunity, it's going to be on the Bridge of Life website, on our Facebook page. It's very simple. You can just click on a link and see, you know, if any meal is requested, any dates and any specialties that they may have, or, you know, they can't have, you know, sugar or chocolate or just any sort of health restrictions. Meal Train's a really exciting program. It's free, and so it's going to be the way we start doing things. So I would just encourage you to keep an eye out on the Bridge of Life Facebook page for that. And uh, Rachel Cost needs jokes for our Wednesday night uh, the Wednesday night Bible study, the stream that we do. You know, Rachel was in my office last Wednesday, and I was watching the, the stream of videos from Dan and Julie Young, and I just couldn't make it through. Like, well, Rachel and I were supposed to be working and constructing this thing, and I just, in the process, I had to hear the jokes, and I just kept laughing at the jokes, and Rachel was just, like, waiting for me to be done. Like, we're, we're supposed to be working, and I was just having this moment. So, uh, anybody that turns in a joke is admitted, for, uh, admitted into a drawing for a uh, free Chick-fil-A gift card just for turning in a joke to uh, email those over to rachel.cost at bridgeoflife.org, and we would just love to have some jokes from all of you guys. Thank you so much for participating. Operation Christmas Child this month, we're accepting toys, and then right around the beginning of November, we're going to have our annual shoebox filling event, where we're going to fill up all of the shoeboxes that we have and then send them overseas. So this month, it's toys, anything, any toy, doesn't matter. Feel free to go out to the dollar store and spend 30 or $40 buying the multi-packs that have five or six toys in each. A little bit of money can go a very long way to children who literally don't have anything. So we've been saving up all year. This month is toys, and thank you very much for your participation there. So I'd like to pray before I uh, open up my word this morning. I have a lot to go over. I know I say this all the time, uh, but I, it's just because it just keeps becoming real and real to me over and over again. What we're going to go over today is just such a, a foundational part of our, of our belief, of our faith, of all the things that comprise Christianity. Like we are really going to just kind of look at something that is, that is core. It's absolutely essential today. I'm honored to go through it together, and so I just want to open up with a word of prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we love you. We want to have you have your way in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives. You are, you are our creator, and you're why we breathe. You're, you're why we're here, God, so that we can return glory and worship to you, Father. And I ask for increase in our hearts and minds today. Renew our minds, God, and just reform us to your way of thinking and let us see your principles and your heart and what we go over today. God, we thank you for your holy scripture. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through scripture. May it just become more and more in our lives today. In your wonderful name I pray. Amen. So, Today is a wonderful day to go over uh, exactly what it is we're going to be going over, church. And the reason is, is because more and more and more is just coming, coming unglued in the community all around us weekly, is it not? 
It's just we're just watching so many things take, take part and take place and people warring with each other and there's just so many different things that are all grabbing for our attention. Everything, all these little leeches in the community and in the news that they want to suck the life and the blood out of us. And so this morning I am encouraged to speak with us about something that is just so, so glorious to know. It's, it's beautiful to fathom. It's why we get to say we are Christians. As we've been walking through First Peter for the past few weeks, We've sort of been always asking ourselves the question in mind as we hear each sermon, how can I be earthly applicable while being heavenly minded? That's something we've been trying just to, to look for answers as we read through scriptures and get a better understanding of not only why we're here, but just the purposes behind God has for us while we're here. But today we're actually going to lay aside that framework, that thinking. We're not going to ask ourselves that question today. Today we're going to let scripture speak at face value. Because there's, there, I can do no better work to the scripture today than to just let it speak for exactly what it has to say. Because as I say, this is like the core of our insides. It's, it's our bones. It's, it's essential to us what we're going to go over today. And I, I love how God is already preparing the way for us in our hearts. I thank you, Carol, for, for being so willing, for, in, under protest, <laughs> to come down and, and confess like that to a group of body. Because what you said is true. So that if we get rid of this, now we can focus on this. Now we can do the Lord's work in our lives. And I, I love that you did that, not only because I respect it and I appreciate it, but, but we as a body need to understand we have a core. There's something at our core that we need to know what is in here. What are we filling our core with? And that's what we're going to look at today, church. Last week, as I, as I sort of ended up you know, talking about we are living stones, we are the new temple, that, that Christ and his followers, his people, the body, are the new temple of God. It's the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us now. And as the end of chapter, the beginning of chapter 2 in verse 4 says, you yourselves are like living stones being built up into a spiritual house. We are the spiritual house, and if we're going to be the spiritual house, church, we have to know what we're made of. We have to know what our core holds. We have to know that even though I may be enduring grievous times, as Peter puts it, that I'm still able to withstand these times because I know what lies at my core. Something I think is very impressive, these people that run these marathons 26 miles and they just go out and do it like it's you know, a quick break at lunchtime, they know how fast they can run. They can run faster than what they are running at that moment because they know how fast they can go. They know if I'm running too fast, I'll never make it to mile 26. They, they know how much they can put out because they know what's at their deepest core. They know what they have fed themselves and what they've built their plans off of. Verse 9 says, I'm re recapping last week quickly, it says, You are a chosen race, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's what I want to see happen worldwide, church. Not that Christians will be known as the people who look down their noses at people or who shake fists or thump people over the head with the Bibles, but that we would, would see it in ourselves, exactly what it says here, so that we may proclaim His excellencies. How many of you all would just love to be known as an ambassador of God who spent your life proclaiming the excellencies of God? There is not a better life that exists on the planet than for us to tune in to this here. We are a living stone. We're a piece of the temple so that we may belong to God. The earth is plagued with confusion right now from right and wrong, church. I've said it every week and I'm going to keep saying it as long as I have to. What we are witnessing right now is good versus evil. This isn't just about an election. This isn't just about an epidemic. This isn't just about an anything other than we are witnessing good fight evil. Church, the world around you has lost its understanding of what is wrong. I believe a couple generations ago, and it's easy for me to pick on a couple generations ago because I wasn't there, but I believe that as the digression of humanity has happened, we are seeing it come into its full effect now because we started removing God from our lives. And that's why we're honestly confused. It would be one thing for my great-grandfather to think, is it wrong for me to burn something down? Of course he would say, well, of course I shouldn't do that. Who would? And now we have people saying, why not? We have confused right and wrong. We have confused all of the things that we as believers need to be mindful of. We as believers need to know what lies at our core. 
And that's why today we're laying aside a temporary question of how can I still be earthly good while being heavenly minded? That is very applicable. We're going to pick it up next week. But today we're going to let God's scripture just speak to us because we need to be reminded of exactly what it is that we are being a part of. So turn with me in your Bible, please, to 1 Peter again. And today we're going to listen for three S's together. Listen for three S's today as we go through scriptures together. I'll give you a minute to turn there, but we're going to start reading in 1 Peter chapter 2 and then verse 11. I've entitled my message today, The Christ Pattern. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, I'm going to read through all the way for the rest of chapter 2 down to verse 25. In church, I just encourage you, as we're reading, just, just look for the theology that's in this. Look for the foundation. This is God speaking to us. Just because this letter was written to people thousands of years ago, and Peter knew that a certain group of people would be reading it and hearing it, does not mean that God did not intend for you and I to hear it the same way. God spoke through Peter and ordained Scripture so you and I can still have it. We can pull from it together today, and it's why it's exciting to read it together. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin, you are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure? This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in His steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Bless the reading of God's holy word together this morning. As I said together, we started last week, we ended with verses 11 through 12, and Peter, there's a shift in Peter's writing here. Like last week, the first two chapters, first chapter and a half, we've been hearing Peter basically speak very, very at large to how do we act in society? How, how do we want society to see us, and how do we endure through difficult times? And right now, there's a shift in Peter's writing. It's obvious in the Greek that he starts talking about what we're supposed to do in society. It's one thing to be, to be wary of how we're going to be seen, but it's another thing to be concentrating now on what it is that we do. How do we direct ourselves towards society? That's something the church needs to stop and pause about, not our church. Christendom needs to stop and pause. In the middle of a global pandemic and watching our world fall apart and tear itself up, what is it that we would find ourselves doing? Has anybody ever like, been told to do a task by your boss and then you get it done before the boss gets back? To me, that's a moment of panic. Even though, I, even though I know I've done what he's asked me to do, I don't want to be seen standing around when the boss gets back. I'll just make a mess so I can clean it up again. I want to be seen being busy. I want to be doing something constantly for him who I support. What are we supposed to be doing with ourselves? So the first S this morning, church, that I offer to us as a truth we find in Scripture is the standard. What are we to be doing? And that is 
to be the standard. What we do consistently will become our behavior. Not what I act like, not, what, not the front that I may put on for certain people in front of certain things, but who I am at my core will define me. That becomes my standard in what I do by behavior. And that affects people's perception. People's perspe- perspective can be adjusted based on what they think it is you're doing. Peter tells the believers to handle themselves not according to what suits them best or according to their preferences, but according to a higher calling and a higher purpose. That's why he said it in verse 11 or 12, I consider you, brothers, consider yourselves exiles. We talked about it two weeks ago. We have been ransomed. Christ's blood purchased us as a ransom, and now we consider ourselves exiles here. This place is not our home. We're going to eventually be in a place where God has everything the way he originally designed it to be. But until we get to be in that place, we are exiles here in this world. And this, this is and it's for the Lord's sake is what Peter is saying. Now this isn't saying we can't have fun, we can't participate, we can't belong to society, we can't go to cookouts, we just need to you know, hide in a cave until the Lord returns. That's not what Peter is saying at all. He wants us to be involved. He wants us to do it. It's for the Lord's sake that we do it. We do these things for the Lord's sake. We live out the Christian standard that the world needs to see for the Lord's sake, not for me. Not so that I can feel I'll end up in heaven one day. Not so that I will feel like a better person because I did a bunch of acts or like righteous deeds. But because it's the work of God that I'm doing as a standard set by Christ himself. Live a disciplined life so that we can be easily recognized as being the standard. By following the standard established for us by Christ, we are to be subjected to every human institution. Letting it soak in. That's people contentious thing to say during these days. We have mandates, we have governors, we have states warring at each other. It is up to us as believers to be subjected to every human institution because our main focus on life, in life, is continuing the work of Christ. That's the standard we see set by Jesus himself. We're supposed to be doing here, continuing his work for the Lord's sake, not considering ourselves above civil authority, but by being willing to submit ourselves to civil authority for the Lord's sake. There are things that we may not like to do. There are things that we don't feel we should have to do. But by doing those things, we actually fulfill Scripture. We fulfill Scripture when we choose to submit ourselves to the authorities, to respect the governor, to honor the emperor, and to fear God. We make verse 15 come true. He says, so that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Well done. Good job. And if, and, and if I can expound on this a minute, since you all are with me, it's not just to put them to silence so that we can sort of feel like I won the argument, is it? That's the wrong heart motive. It's so that they can see there is a difference. There is a higher calling, a higher purpose that I'm living my life to. You're right. I don't have to do that, but I'm going to do this. Because my focus is not on this world. My focus is not on this planet. My focus is not on this, this entity that I find myself in. I may, live, I may live here, but I'm in exile here. I would like to see the land that I'm exiled from be the land. I want to see God's presence here, and I get to do that by continuing the work of Christ here. It's the reason we live why we do. If there's anything that we can do to help others see the love that we have for our God... If there's anything that we can do to help others find an awe in God, the God that we serve, then we should, my brothers and sisters, do it. We should be willing to submit to it, whether it be authorities or brothers and sisters or things that we just don't necessarily feel like doing. We do it out of love because it's a standard we see set. One thing that I just love to do is watch documentaries. I love a documentary about anything. I could watch documentaries about dirt I just love to learn. I love learning. Guess what puts my wife to sleep? Documentaries about anything. Especially dirt. Especially dirt. 
Now, as a husband, I can choose to say, no, it's what I want to do. I want to watch documentaries. We watched, you know, The Office last night, so I want to watch Dirt tonight, you know. But, we, but when we live our lives based on what we get to do or what we choose to do, we find that higher purpose. We find the higher calling. It doesn't matter what I get to declare belongs to me. It doesn't matter what I get to declare I deserve. What am I going to choose to do? It's not how I get to act. It's how I choose to act. I choose to respond in love. I choose to to sit through the office for the umpteenth time in a row. I choose to bite my tongue when my boss speaks to me in a way that I don't think I deserved. It's how we choose to act because it is done for the Lord's sake so that we can put to silence foolish people who speak ignorantly of us. Isn't that amazing that all of that ties in now just like it was written thousands of years ago? It's not what we can't do, church. It's what we choose to do as exiles. Which leads us to verse 16. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Yes, I may be free to do certain things, but I should never abuse my power that enables me to do those certain things. It's a decision from the heart. We're free to follow the standard, but it's an act of our heart that we choose to follow the standard. This is the decision that all things have to come from our heart. You know, the Christian, the Christian in the world today may think, well, I'm allowed to do this because my sin has been covered. That's true, but if we use our salvation as a license to sin, we disgrace God. If we use His grace, His redemptive work, like a napkin to wipe off the mess off our face, then we actually drag Christ through the mud, crucifying Him all over again, is what scriptures call it. We have abused the most wonderful thing that's ever been given to us. And that's why we focus on what our freedom has enabled us to do, not what our freedom gets to cover up. For by grace we have been saved through faith. We are saved. We don't lose our salvation when we need grace. But we also don't use grace in ways it wasn't meant to be. Used is. An attitude that abuses the freedom we have in Christ is not what Peter's endorsing. He's saying use the freedom that you have to influence the world for Christ. It's true, you don't have to come back to the temple now like they used to. You had to go to the temple all the time. You don't have to come here and constantly be making sacrifices over and over again. So now you can travel to the uttermost parts of the earth. Use that freedom to promote the gospel of Christ. Use that freedom to go places that maybe people wouldn't really want to go, but you're chasing after people you love. It's, it's, the what, it's what Christian behavior is going to be molded by. Whenever we look outside and see the world pillaging and destroying and tearing itself up, what will the body of Christ say we can do in this situation? We can walk into those places and we can say, I am here as God's ambassador to turn this situation around and use my freedom to influence people for Christ, for the Lord's sake. It is not until government attempts to force us to do what is against the law of God that we should reject and rebel against the government. I'll say it again because you can quote me on it. It is not until government attempts to force us to do what is against the law of God that we should reject and rebel against the government. We submit to societal authority because the society we live in rejects God. We submit to societal authority because our local society authority rejects God. We automatically distinguish ourselves as followers of God whenever we do simple things. I'll give you a modern-day example. I grew up not wearing a seatbelt. I was told we don't need to wear those things. So I don't wear seatbelts until I got married and had a kid. Now, my putting on a seatbelt says something else about me. It says I care about what my wife and son think when I'm driving a car because I'm setting a good example for my son and my wife. Now, she, she made the example. She made me into being somebody that cares about responsibility. But the point is, I grew up according to a certain thing. Now, am I free to not wear a seatbelt? I don't have to wear a seatbelt. But I accomplish a greater good for my son's sake if I do wear my seatbelt. We can accomplish a greater good for our city by submitting to societal authority because we automatically label ourselves as a people of peace as a people who choose to submit, and as a people who are concerned about our higher calling in life, not concerned about what do I have to act like. Verse 18 says, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this 
is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. I'll admit to you, church, that's not something I want to read very often. I want to stand up the minute I am offended. I want to stand up the minute anybody says something against me. I want to stand up and find a soapbox and stand on that and say it louder until they cry and say they're sorry. That's the flesh in me. That's the unforgiveness that sits inside of us and says, and until you come to me, I am digging my heels in over here. But church, unfortunately, that's not what we get to see here in verse 18. And God even kind of like puts it in our face too, and he says, it is a gracious thing. So God isn't saying like you're, you're suffering unjustly. He's saying it is a good thing. It's a gracious thing whenever you suffer unjustly, when one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. You may be thinking, are you telling me I'm supposed to let my boss be mad, be upset with me, be unkind to me? Kinda. And I'll tell you why. Because I've had bad bosses. And I know what everybody does the minute the boss leaves the room. How many of y'all don't know what I'm talking about? Angelica is the only one in the church. <laughs> Poor Lily. She's never had a boss. We, as co-workers, we conspire against the boss, don't we? I mean, we say that. We, we, we let everybody know exactly how we feel. And just imagine there's one person who stood silent the whole time. Immediately, that person is identified as not participating in what is popular. Immediately, they have distinguished themselves from society, from the norm, from the gossip that's going on. And I guarantee you, church, there's going to be an automatic correlation to, I bet they're a believer. I guarantee you. Because we, as his people, have a standard that is set for us. He even says, being mindful of God in this situation, being mindful of God, it's a gracious thing. How many of you all would be upset if I got my hand smacked for reaching inside the cookie jar. My grandmother actually used to have a jar of cookies, and I would, it, even though the rules know, if I reached inside, stole a cookie, and she smacked my hand, how many of y'all would feel bad for me? You shouldn't. Why? I got what I deserved? Is that sort of what you're feeling? I got what I deserved. So what about if my boss said, hey, Justin, if you do such and such a thing, I'm going to give you a $1,000 bonus for Christmas, and so I do such and such a thing, and then at Christmas, my boss takes that $1,000 in the budget and buys himself a set of golf clubs. Now, I would like to say I'm going to chase him with one of those golf clubs. You will be sorry. Am I willing to watch my, my boss play golf with my bonus? Hmm. That's what it's going to take whenever Peter says being mindful of the Lord. This isn't just a grin and bear it. This isn't just bite your tongue. This is I am choosing to not respond with purpose. The purpose being I am being mindful of the Lord. I am not suffering unjustly without purpose. I am suffering unjustly because it is a gracious thing. It's a gracious thing for me to suffer unjustly because it allows me to be mindful of God. These are some of the most difficult things I think we could ever have to process, church. It certainly goes against the norm, it goes against society, it goes against the standard. Nowadays that we, that we hear of, if you've been offended, you should stand up and break something. You, know, you should stand up and let the world know how you feel and be, be fully convinced, church. I am aware as a fellow human that this is not stuff that comes natural to us, but that's why I call it our core, because this is the stuff that we get to choose. How am I going to respond in life? Am I going to make a decision based on faith? Can I believe all of these things to be true? And even if I can't see it now, how will I still choose to act? Will I be mindful of God? Or am I willing to suffer unjustly? Peter's only re repeating here what he heard the Lord Jesus himself say on Mount Olive in Matthew 5. Jesus himself, God himself, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. That's what Jesus says next. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for they so persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we have the standard again. 
The standard is the prophets were persecuted before us. The standard is Jesus himself was persecuted even though he never sinned, had no guile. He did not revile whenever people slandered him. We never see the Christian standard being stand up and shout, stand up and shake a fist, stand up on something and and just scream until you're hurt. We see the Christian standard being I choose to submit, being mindful of my gracious acts for the sake of the Lord. It's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy for me. Just because I'm speaking, it does not mean I have it mastered. I'm just kind of saying it over again. But one thing I do know, church, one thing I know more than I don't like the, the contempt I feel in my spirit when I have difficult instructions from God is I do want to do what verse 20 says. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. That matters more to me than seeking retribution against a go- with a golf club against my boss. That matters more to me than telling my coworkers or anybody else in the world exactly what I think of them when I've been upset and when I hear them talking about me because my response matters. How I respond matters. Verse 21 says, church, as I finish up the first S this morning, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. There's our standard. There's our example. You know, the Greek word that Peter used here, for example, actually is the word we've lost it in our translations, but it actually means trace. You know how we, we want to draw something. We would put a piece of paper under and then put the original on top so, so we could actually trace out something. That's actually where the word comes from, to make an example, so that we can literally be a carbon copy. That's what Peter is telling us. Christ has set the example for you so that we can be a carbon copy of him. The second S this morning, substitute. The first one is standard. The second we find is substitute. In church, this is verse 24. This is worth memorizing. This is worth tattooing across the back of your eyelids. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Songs have been written. Books have been written. People have died on hills. I mean, churches have split. There's been so much happened over this verse, church so that we can die to this and live for that. And notice how it says, in his body on the tree. This isn't a a folklore story. This isn't the Easter bunny and Santa Claus stuff. This is in his body. My substitute. He died as a substitute so that I could live to righteousness. Even though he didn't deserve death, he accepted death because you and I both deserve to die. We deserve to die because we're born dead in sin, is what scriptures tell us. We are born dead, separated from God. If our blood would be poured out as a ransom, it wouldn't be worth much. It's tainted with something. It's tainted with sin. But the blood of Christ himself, as poured out as a ransom for people to be his exiles, purchased us. And there's a term that that kind of wraps all this together. It's called substitutionary atonement substitutionary atonement may sound like a big fancy word you may think pastor you're being boring i don't care about big words we need to know it he died as our substitute his death was an atoning sacrifice and yet he and i were switched he didn't deserve to die i do so he died and simultaneously i died because he was my substitute It's the mastery of God on display to see that God himself came up with a solution plan of substituting himself in our place so that the justice of God could be completed while simultaneously demonstrating God's great mercy. You see that? It's mastery. It's mastery. Both things happening at the same time. The wrath of God was poured out because sin was real and it was active and it had to be dealt with. God is completely just. He can't be not just. For God to say, don't worry about it, I'm going to slide it to the side as an unjust judge. But God completely satisfied his justiceness while simultaneously showing us his mercy by substituting himself in us. And we we can die to sin too. And I'll prove it to you. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I 
have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. It's amazing. It's amazing. I wish I had better words other than brilliance and mastery to describe God, but church, to see his rescue plan in place through this substitutionary atonement, it's just, it takes the words from my mouth. All I can do is just stand up in awe and worship him and say, Father, you are absolutely amazing. My life is yours. That is our focus here. We see it as the standard. We see Christ as our substitute. He has healed us. By his stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. Our spiritual birth of death has been healed. We were born dead, and now we get to live because we've been healed. Not because I did it, not because I found a way or found a secret or found a special pill. Christ himself says, I'll die so that they can live. Absolutely amazing. By his wounds, we are healed, we have risen and free and ready to walk in newness of life. I have the exact same thing that I say every time I baptize somebody, and it says exactly these words, you are raised into newness of life. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised into newness of life. Church, the world needs to see that newness by our actions, by our mentalities, by our apologies, by our willingness to say, I'm going to suffer unjustly because it's going to be a gracious thing done for the sake of the Lord. It leads us to our third S this morning, church. If we can acknowledge all the things I'm talking about today, I know it's a lot we're going through, but I just have to, I have to keep going. The third S this morning is our shepherd. God is not some distant thing. Jesus is not some bedtime story. Our reality is real. And I would suggest to you and anybody who would hear my voice that anybody that looks outside us, we, we can see in ourselves intelligent design, our brains, our eyeballs, our bodies alone. Creation itself declares the glories of God, as the psalmist said. So we can acknowledge that there is an intelligent creator behind all of this. For me, there's just no, there's never been a question. There's never been an issue for me of acknowledging where did we come from. I can see it through God. I see it through intelligent design and through his creation. So it leads us to a response. Will I look to him as my savior? Will I look to him as my shepherd? Or will I continue to have my life run by what I see best? That's where the world falls apart. Because I believe God lays it on all of our hearts, as Romans says, that God will speak to us, and God will reveal himself to us, but it's up to men and women to listen. It's up to us to say that even if it doesn't come natural to me, I'm going to look at the example you set, and when I look at the example, I see a standard, and I see a standard based on your substitution. So Lord Jesus, I look to you to be my shepherd. Despite my questions, despite the concerns I have, despite the claims against you, I'm going to look past all of those things and use the freedom you've given me to turn more hearts towards you. Verse 25, church says, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Will we follow him as our shepherd? Will we look to his finished work on the cross and see not only God's wrath poured out, but a blood debt paid so that we could live to righteousness? The world needs to see the righteousness of Christ as exemplified in his followers today, church. Amen? The world is dying without it. The world is lost and dying without it, and it's on our watch. It's happening on our watch. This is, this is some of the most, I guarantee you, church, history books, if the Lord tarries that long, will we'll recollect in great detail what you and I are living through right now. So let's not wait it out. Let's not just look forward to a day when it's all over with. Let's, let's see how can we affect our employees? How can we affect our coworkers and our neighbors and the world around us? Whenever they look at you and say, why aren't you concerned? You say, because I'm in exile. This world is not my home. I'm temporarily stranded here. 
but I'm choosing while I'm here to follow after my good shepherd. Earlier today, I said we're not reading an answer to a question. We're just reading to let it marinate deep within us. And this message of gospel that I'm going over today, church, may seem like dry. It may seem documentary-style stuff. It may just seem like folklore to some, but I promise you, with all that is in me, the onus of what we are going through today is actually very, very simple. Nowhere in scriptures does this say, and I've read this cover to cover, nowhere does it say, ask Jesus into your heart. The message of the gospel is simply this, repent and believe the gospel. That's the message that was given. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. What will you take to the world around you? Take the message, it's simple. Repent and believe the gospel. There is such a thing as being saved and continuing to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, as Paul put it. Salvation is a process. Sanctification is a process. We don't have to have all the answers to all the questions. We don't have to fear what people may respond to us as we offer them this gospel message. But I guarantee you this, church, if you regard your life as dead to you, but alive for him and a gracious act done for the work of God, you will never, ever be alone. Not only will you have the brotherhood, as scriptures calls it, our church, the brothers and sisters that we have here together today, not only will you have that, but you will literally have God himself, the Holy Spirit, living inside you along the way to give you answers to questions, to point, to guide, to to convict, and to love. We will never be alone, ever. If the worship team would join me back on stage, please. As I just continue to, to begin to close this morning, I know it's lunchtime, it's time to go, but these verses we've gone over today tell us to be willing to endure unjustly for the sake of the Lord, church, and I'm telling you because He is worthy. It's because He is worthy He substituted Himself for us, not because somebody forced Him to, not because somebody made Him to, but because God Himself said, I don't want my children lost in an existence that's devoid of my presence. That is the greatest gospel message the world could ever hear. Whenever you say to, your, to those who you may choose to say it to, repent and believe the gospel, they may say, what's that mean? It's the greatest story you can ever hear. Let me share it with you. God himself stepped down into our creation to pay a bill that his children had accumulated, and when they crucified him on the cross, he said the word to telestai, which means it is paid. You have been ransomed you are now an exiled church waiting to go back to him. This is why we live. This is why we carry on his gospel message. Church, a life given to Christianity is not a death sentence to fun. It's not a death sentence to good times. It's not a death sentence to anything except our death sentence. Jesus himself said that I did not come to do these things. I have come so that people may have life and that they could live it to the fullest. That is the life that I want to live. Verse 21, as I say it one last time, Christ came and set us as an example for us. May we choose to see him as the greatest example for every day for the rest of our lives. Lord Jesus, as I close this morning, I just ask that you would please give, give these words that I have spoken this morning increase in people's hearts. God, we've gone over a lot. I ask that you would just please simplify it and just let it permeate and just marinate all throughout our hearts and minds today. Lord Jesus, at the end of every day, we want to honor you. We want to serve you because you are worthy. May you be glorified in our lives. May you be glorified here in this place, in this city. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.